Thank, thanks, Frank, and uh, very early morning for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, good morning and good afternoon, um, all our attendees who are here, and also to my esteemed panel. Um, we're here to talk about um, growth in Asia and how to manage sustainable growth in Asia. For those that don't know, about a year and a half ago, this um, this meeting was supposed to take place in the city of Kitakyushu in in, um, in Japan. I hear someone's dog, but that's fine. In Japan, um, which with Kitakyushu being a, a model example of how macroeconomic policies can lead a city to to sustainably and and successfully fight unemployment, poverty, and, and build communities. Um, to, to introduce the Kitakyushu model, um, we, we have this, um, Tatsu Ohara, who is the president of the Asian Growth Research Institute of Japan, and who's actually a Kitakyushu, um, uh, Kitakyushu citizen, or a, a resident, um, if I'm not mistaken. So um, Tatsu, why don't you introduce the Kitakyushu model and yourself a little bit, and then I will throw the introductions to our other panelists. Thank you very much. Um, can you can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Tatsuo Hata, and uh, I was uh, brought up in uh, Kitakyushu and graduated from uh, Kokura High School, which is uh, in the city. And then uh, I became an academic economist, and I taught at uh, Johns Hopkins University for about nine years. And then uh, after retiring from University of Tokyo, I started to work for this uh, Asian Growth Research Institute located in, in my hometown, Kitakyushu. Now, uh, I'd like to introduce the Kitakyushu model uh, of the environment in the context of uh, discussing various environmental policies we need to pursue in attaining sustainable uh, Asian growth. In particular, I like to discuss three distinctly different types of environmental policies. The first is local pollution, uh, local pollution control, uh, such as controlling air and water pollution, so that residents in each local area can get better living at, uh, environment. In this regard, the city of Kitakyushu made remarkable accomplishments since the 70s. In the 60s, Kitakyushu was one of the major industrial towns in Japan, and the so-called rainbow of factory smoke in blue, gray, yellow, and red covered the sky. The water of Dokaiwan Bay, surrounded by factories, was so poisonous that it killed barnacles at the bottom of the ships uh, anchored at the bay in two days. In the 70s, however, the mothers started to complain about the health hazard for their children, uh, health hazard of pollution for their children. The city then pioneered strict pollution regulation, which transformed the city into one of the greenest industrial towns in Japan in just a few, year, a few, few years. Um, for example, well, somehow, the in screens, uh, it's, it's stationary as, as I look. Is it working all right? My, my face doesn't move. No, you, you don't have that problem. Okay, I only seem to have it. Okay, uh, now... I can hear you uh, just fine, though. Okay. Um, for example... Uh, well, uh, the city uh, then pioneered strict pollution regulation, which transformed the city into one of the greenest industrial towns in Japan just in just a few years. For example, prawns have returned to Dokawan Doka Bay. And also, the city's advanced environmental code triggered various technological innovations in the area. For example, the city waterworks bureau acquired a patent uh, to purify water by making use of bacteria. The city transferred this technology to ASEAN countries as part of international cooperation. An example of the fruit of this effort is that uh, Waterworks Bureau in Phnom Penh now supplies drinkable water. Now, the second type of environmental policy, of course, is uh, 
a reduction of CD, uh, CO2 emission. The central government, rather than local governments, can most effectively cope with this issue. But the city of Kitakyushu is making every effort to be a model of a carbon-free city. The third type of environmental policy is preparing for the dreadful possibility of actual global warming, despite our effort uh, to fight against it. Global warming has self-enforcing effects. The warmed ocean discharges more CO2 from uh, itself and uh, warmed uh, condola releases a massive amount of uh, methane uh, gas from, uh, from the earth. While fighting against global warming, we should at the same time prepare for the possibility of flood damage, increased infectious diseases, and loss of lands due to raised water levels. Since global warming endangers the south more severely than the north, ample room exists for the north to help the south uh, construct dikes and uh, invest, uh, invent uh, drug medicines, for example. Policymakers and media have not been paying much attention to the need for the third environmental policy so far. Still, we need to ensure against the advent of global warming by exploring a wide range of countermeasures if we consider sustainable Asian growth seriously. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was great, and it's a great opening on, on how one city was able to, to bring about these sustainable policies based on community needs and, 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 and through actions of the community. Um, next up, um, Nishab Forbes from Forbes Marshall in India. Um, maybe introduce yourself and, and, and your background and then just a bit of an opening and then I can move on to my next panelist. Sure. Thank, thank you, Cod. Thanks. Uh, great pleasure to be with you today. And uh, let me quickly introduce myself and then make one comment and then I'll move on to, uh, we can go on to discussion. So um, the, uh, I, m I work with a family business in, in India. It's 75 years old now. We work in the area, of Forbes Marshall works in the area of uh, uh, steam engineering and control instrumentation. Uh, we started as an Indian company. Uh, we've tried to become more international over the last 20 years or so. Uh, we now are quite active in uh, through Southeast Asia, uh, the Middle East, uh, East Africa, North Africa, and uh, some parts of Europe. Um, and uh, uh, we, we, one of our key businesses is really energy conservation. And I think that relates, that will relate to uh, some of my comments uh, later on. Uh, I have a second background, which is that I used to uh, teach a course once a year at a university in the U.S., uh, which I graduated from, uh, on technology in developing countries. Um, and that tended to be a comparative look at how uh, technical capability developed uh, largely in East Asia, but also in Latin America, and of course, keeping the Indian experience uh, constantly in my head. Uh, and then third, uh, I've played uh, uh, quite a, uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time with um, uh, the Confederation of Indian Industry, uh, which is the country's leading industry association, and I was president of CIA in 2016-17. Uh, 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 so with those three backgrounds, if you like, um, my comments will reflect that, that background. Um, so if we talk about sustainability and sustainable development in India, um, and I'm going to talk from an Indian perspective, um, you know, the Indian perspective so far has tended to be a perspective of, look, recognize the legacy of inequity in past emissions. And while that's true, it's accurate, it's fine, it doesn't get one very far as a country in itself uh, because at the end of the day, uh, achieving carbon neutrality is in India's interest. It's not just an equity issue. It's an direct self-interest issue. So we have uh, a real need uh, to achieve carbon neutrality and see the world achieves carbon neutrality as fast as possible. Um, because India will be one of the countries 
most affected by global warming. Uh, it will be one of the countries most affected by uh, rising sea levels, for example, um, and uh, one of the countries most affected by increases in aggregate temperatures uh, across the central plains of the country. So it's in our direct interest, and I think we should keep reminding ourselves that we're doing this, yes, we're doing this for the planet and the world, but we're also doing this because there is very direct self-interest um, in ensuring that we have and build as sustainable a future for ourselves uh, as we can. Now, second comment about India. Uh, India is a country that, as you know, is very complex. We have a federal structure, so we have a union government, we have lots of state governments, 28 state governments, um, and we have varying levels of state capacity that runs across the country. In other words, policies that are formulated with the best of intentions um, have some difficulty in implementation on the ground, um, I, even at the union le government level and certainly at the local level by the time they actually get to uh, a city. So with that in mind, it's important that the policy options that we consider are options that take into account that limited state capacity. With that in mind, um, I've always felt that the best possible policy um, for carbon neutrality is a carbon tax and a fairly high carbon tax. Uh, the proposal that is being discussed now more and more in India is that we should start with a carbon tax of $25 per ton and ensure that that is a flaw, that the tax then rises progressively over the years uh, to a much higher level, because that in itself will enable the phasing out of many polluting elements. Uh, it will enable the phasing out, for example, of coal. Uh, as you know, as you know uh, at, in Glasgow recently, there was this big discussion over phasing out the use of coal versus phasing down the use of coal. I mean, I think the, uh, the, the whole point of phasing down is to phase out uh, eventually. Um, it's a matter of timing more than anything else. And I think if one ensures a high enough carbon tax, one will achieve uh, just that. One will achieve a phasing out, a phasing down leading uh, eventually to phasing out. So my, my advocacy for India really would be how do we come up with a few of these kinds of larger interventions that could have multiplier impacts where the actual implementation then depends on the market the actual implementation then depends on each individual firm and each individual acting in their own self-interest, but within a framework that ensures a sustainable future. If we can do that, it seems to me that we as a country would progress much more rapidly and we will progress much more consistently in this direction of a long-term sustainable carbon neutral future. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was great, Nishad. Um um, moving on to my next guest, Vinod Sakar um, of the Petra Group in Malaysia. Um, just introduce yourself, your company, and then a brief comment on the topic before we get too deep into it. Okay, I'll try to keep it brief. I'm, uh, my name is Vinod Sheikh. I, I run a conglomerate called the Petra Group. Uh, we're a diverse conglomerate, global, uh, specifically in areas from recycling to sustainable uh, agriculture uh, to you know, innovative technologies, uh, modular building technologies, uh, and uh, media. Um, we we have we call ourselves social capitalists. Um, we believe in making money, making lots of money if we can. But we believe that you need to lift the community and society with you along the way. We believe the days of economic leaders, and businessmen, and businesswomen saying they're no longer involved in they're not involved in societal development is gone. Uh, we, I advocate the idea that businesses must be involved in societal development, whether it's carbon neutrality, whether it's fighting climate change. Uh, but more importantly, to me, there's no point fighting climate change if you're not going to deal with the human issue. That is poverty, malnutrition, and everything else. You know, you've got to save the planet and save the people along with it. And it has to be done together, holistically. It can't be done separately. Uh, so poverty eradication is one of the key elements. Education is one of the key elements that will help you fight uh, climate change as well. 
And so we're one of these companies that believe in social capitalism, that is sustainable wealth creation. Um, you know, if you're smart enough to make lots of money, you're smart enough to do and help people around you and the community you're in. Um, I would just say that, I mean, I, I look, at, look at it from this perspective. We need economic integration. Without economic integration, whether it's ASEAN and the Greater Reset in some form, one form, one form or another, we're not going to deal with climate change. There's no point in Malaysia taking up a position and doing something in Malaysia if Indonesia, Thailand, uh, Philippines and others don't follow. It, it, unless we do it combined, then we'll have impact. Uh, doing it on our own will lead nowhere. Uh, so economic integration is, is a key element in fighting climate change, I believe. And one of the th problems of economic integration and RECEP is the divergence of socioeconomic issues of every country. Uh, the differences, you know, for China and India, India's farmers don't want you know, much integration that will, that because they can't compete with China. At the same time, uh, uh, you know, China, Indian farmer would love to have more economic integration because they can compete. So there are lots of issues. And I believe one of the ways to deal with this is a handicap system. And, you know, golf. I know golf, I know golf, but if we look at golf from a perspective of handicaps, I think every country should get a handicap or every, every industry should get a handicap. And based on that handicap, it equalizes, you know, uh, the poorest countries, the richest countries to the to most uh, strong economies to, to, to less strong economies. If you have a handicap of 20 and someone handicap of three, this is the amount of, of strokes you get to, to compete and to move forward. And that is that is the kind of thinking I think we need to work out a commercial economic way of doing this pragmatically and logically because if we don't find a pragmatic and logical solution we're just going to be talking forever and not really achieving the goals we need perfect that was that was a good introduction to many topics but before we get into the meat of it um i see eric has, has joined us um from the aiib in china eric um we're just introducing ourselves we got started a little late um because of some technical issues but if you could, could you introduce yourself just briefly, um, and then and then there's some questions that we'll jump into after your introduction. Okay, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to to this um, interesting session. Uh, so I'm uh, Eric Berloff. I'm the chief economist of the AIB since about a year. Uh, before that, I was um, or I'm on leave as a professor at the LSE, and before that, I was a chief economist at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Perfect. That was actually a really succinct and, and great introduction because it was brief. Um, so I have I have some um, questions to the panelists um, based on the issues that they brought up in their introductions. Um, one one of one of the things that we've talked about when, when we talk about sustainable growth um, is is climate change, and that's something that all our panelists have touched upon at, in in their um, in their brief remarks. I, I wonder, on the back of what happened in Glasgow. And, and, and on this world stage where there is a debate, is it unfair, do you think, that we're placing tremendous um, pressure on developing countries to conform to ideas of sustainable growth, given that when the developed countries, as they are today in the world, when they were going through the same phase of development in their countries' histories, no such restrictions were placed on those countries. No one ever told, you know, the Britain, the Britain and France of the Industrial Revolution that you had to cut down on your coal emission to to sort of make you know to to sort of fight a global pandemic. Do you think it's unfair then for the world to be putting pressure on countries like India and China and other Southeast Asian countries to cut down on emissions and things in in the in the name of the fight against climate change when the developed countries putting on these pressures never had to face similar restraints? Open to the floor. So, yeah, please. So, so you know, so, so my answer would be, yes, it's unfair, but we should still accept it and move on, um, because it's at the end of the day in our interest. Um, I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't stray away from the fact that it is unfair. Um, it is the fact that uh, the developed world today has benefited from um, polluting like mad for, uh, for, for, for over two centuries. And that's what's got us into the current situation. But let's just accept that and say, that's what's been done. This is where we are now. It's now in our direct interest to actually ensure that we move on 
and ensure as sustainable a future as we can for all of us. And that means that we all have to participate in that process, including developing countries and including India and China. Um, to me, it was very disappointing that China was not present um, in Glasgow in any degree of senior presence, uh, simply because, you know, maybe because of COVID, whatever, but it's the world's largest polluter today. Um, it was missing in action in Glasgow, which I think was a pity. India was present um, in, in, some, in some force. Uh, the prime minister went there as well. He made some important commitments, which were very valuable and very useful. It was the first commitment by anyone from India uh, to go for net zero. Um, yes, it's 2070. That seems a long time away, but it's still an important step forward to actually commit to a net zero target uh, for the first time for the country. And as we work on it, I hope we can bring that date, that date forward. Yeah? So I would say, you know, yes, it's unfair, but let's accept that it's unfair and then move on and do what we can um, because it's in our interest to actually work towards a more sustainable future. I, um, if I could add, I, I agree with you, Nashar. I agree with you. But I think, we must, like you said, we mustn't ignore the fact that it's unfair. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We mustn't ignore the fact that, for example, in Malaysia, we have the most ancient rainforest in the world. And, of course, we have a problem with logging and palm oil plantations and, uh, that we have to deal with, with Malaysians themselves want to be dealt with. But, you know, it, it, it provides a huge income uh, for smallholders and the poorest community in Malaysia. So we have to find a balance. That's why this handicap system, we have to find a way of, of dealing with things, telling the, the, the rich that you've already made money, you know, for the past 200 years by, by doing exactly what you don't want us to do, right? By, by destroying your environment and all your, all your uh, trees and you want us to stop, fine, we agree, should be done completely we can't ignore it but can you pay please can we find a structure where you pay so that when we stop this we have enough income to take care of the impact on the communities not the businesses but the communities that will be suddenly without income without an ability to have an education system everything because they supply education schools uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We've got to find that balance somehow to deal with, but there's no question we have to deal with it. But that's why I think one of the, one of the disappointments I had with COP and everything else, and I attended the side meetings as well, uh, is the lack of involvement with SMEs, with global businesses, but small and medium-sized businesses in the region, because you want real change. You need businesses to buy in. Politicians change every five years. Policies change as politicians change, as governments change. And then one political leader will say, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, it was there. That, that, was, that was another agenda of another government. And, and this goes on. But if you get businesses to buy in, industries to buy in, and they're fully integrated into the process and they commit, then you will have long-term change, I think. Can I come in? Uh, since I didn't really have to make uh, an introductory remark. So, so um you know, building on what uh, the previous two speakers said, I think I agree with uh, basically everything that was said. I think, you know, what what we must not hap let happen is that, you know, we are moving this process along and we lose a lot of countries on the way. And I think that's the, the key issue that we are, we are struggling with. So, so and, and kind of working for one of the uh, multilateral development banks, you know, we, we really see it as our role to try to, facilitate and, and, and help and work with these uh, countries that are, um, you know, facing these unfair challenges, but, uh, and, you know, as, as previous speakers have said, the necessary challenges. And, and we, we have a you know, very important and, and, you know, very difficult role to, to, to make that happen. I think there is one thing that, that it, particularly in Asian context is very interesting is the, you know, the, what has been absolutely instrumental in the growth of, um, of many Asian countries and, and the change over the last uh, 10 or 15 years or so is, is dramatic in terms of participation, participation in global value chains. And I think that is one um, dimension that, that uh, I think is going to be increasingly important when we think about how to address climate change in the region. Uh, because it, it is exactly as the previous speaker mentioned, you know, these, you know when com companies that are in charge of these global value chains start committing and we have handle on, on, on their 
um, engagement at different stages of, of the uh, va these value chains, that's when we have a real possibility to, you know, on, in addition to the peer pressure and, and maybe what uh, multilateral development banks can do in, in terms of, of helping uh, these countries uh, uh, do the right investment. I think if we can put pressure on them, engage with these uh, lead firms in the global value chains, that's a, a very real opportunity to, to get change across countries, which we have very few instruments to do today, and, and across sectors. And, and, and so that's, I think, what we, we should really in, in Asia focus on. How, how can we engage with these companies? How can we, at the other end, f encourage countries to uh, develop uh, the carbonization opportunities for these uh, uh, global value chain companies? You know, they're, whether it's about green um, power or it's a green... Uh, infrastructure, this can become also a very strong incentives for countries that want to stay engaged or, or want to join these uh, global value chains. I think we have a real opportunity here to, 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 to change um, the possibility for countries to, to join this march to net zero. I think, um, is there anything to add to, to that point yeah. on this topic? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes, well, I'm sorry that I have the same uh, video problem uh, as we had the last time. Uh, it always seems to be all right. But, well, uh, first of all, I agree with uh, uh, what uh, all the other speakers said, especially Mr. Forbes' idea. I, I agree with, uh, with respect to uh, everything. Now, uh, in terms of Carl's original question, that the, I think uh, Mr. Forbes' uh, uh, sort of, uh, idea that we should emphasize carbon tax or carbon pricing uh, is a very essential idea. That should be standard for every country and we should not reduce the standard. But at the same time, the developed countries should make a compensation to the uh, developing countries in a lump sum manner. It should not be the, in the form of reduced standard but it should be given just in a cash, <laughs> in a, so to speak. And I think that's, uh, uh, that's an important thing. And, uh, well, uh, that implies more and more this uh, idea of uh, carbon pricing or carbon tax is very important, uh, while the European countries seem to emphasize the uh, uh, renewable aspects more. And but if you're really concerned with global warming, I think uh, uh, the uh, level of carbon emission should be reduced. Thank you. Great. That was a great, I, I got a, a little bit in the middle there, but I, I got the gist of my, what everyone was saying. Um, that was a great response to the first question. My second question is um, on the back of Glasgow and on the back of what everyone's saying here that, you know, um, things need to be, the, the, it's a good first step both in terms of setting goals for our respective countries and also for the planet in terms of fighting climate change and uh, achieving sustainable growth. Um, all of the conversations I hear around this topic tends to be very top down. And I do agree with um, Vinod when he said that what, what seems to be missing out is the community input into um, the, the fight against climate change and the fight for sustainable growth in our various countries. I think um, the Kirikyushu model that we talked about at the beginning and that Tatsuo introduced us was very community driven. The reason that this, this model city came about in Japan was because a group of really unhappy, um, you know, wives and family members um, wanted to see change and they brought about it. So how much, what should we focus on the community when we talk about sustainable growth? And what can we do to empower the voices from these communities? The floor is open. Well, I, so. Yeah, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, um, no, no, so, 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 I, so I, I mean, it's so fundamental for everything we want to do, I think, in, 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 in development that we need to bring communities along. And, and there are, you know, these changes that we are going through now and, and, and related to, to, to the net zero transition are, are there are massive uh, distributional consequences that you know different uh, communities are affected differently, and within communities there would be the same. Uh, you know there would be differences across different households and so on, and and uh, so we we absolutely need to engage uh, with the communities uh, on every dimension of, of this net zero transition. And 
And I think that, you know, becoming from an infrastructure bank, you know, every infrastructure product is, is embedded in a social context. And, and, you know, if we are going to get the kind of behavioral changes that we are, are necessary to realize uh, uh, the net zero transition, you know, it has to engage these uh, local communities. We need to think much more about how do we make this a, a just transition. We talked earlier about, you know, the, the different countries uh, having a, a, an unfair burden here, but but uh, that we also have individual, com- you know, uh, parts of communities and individual communities that are suffering uh, unfairly on this. So we, we this has to be a community-based approach. I completely agree with that. Vinod, you, you had something? Yeah. Can I just add, I mean, again, we have to be very practical about this. Um, uh, this conversation has gone on for a long, long time, uh, decades in the making. Um, and the, the issue is very simple. It's not just community. It's the economy. It's the businesses as well. We need both sides to work together. So, therefore, I think we need leadership among economic leaders. We need businesses. We need champions to come on board and work with community. And that they together form the community. A community is not just the people, but the businesses within that community. Absolutely. Yeah, and so we need that together. And let's never forget, as much as I, you, all of us want a net zero world, we we want, I mean, we're dying. We're, we're, We're killing our worlds. We have to have that. But the challenge we're facing, unless we address that, is the lack of education and poverty. Because when you go to these people, that you need to convince in the community. And you tell them, listen, we need you to do this but they're sitting there wondering whether they have enough money to feed their children tomorrow or send their kids to school. Their first reaction goes, yeah, I'm sorry, I need this first. You know, yeah, yeah, I understand, you know, climate change, all that, but I have this problem now. Now, of course, the education side makes them understand that, hello, climate change is impacting your world, is impacting your economy, is impacting your farms, is impacting your ability to fish, is impacting many areas. But that comes again with education of that community. So we somehow need to deal with that issue head on. We need to educate, provide education. We need to then provide solutions as the transition happens. And we need economic leaders to come in and be champions together. If we can do that, then you'll see real change within communities. And we do it within communities and another community and another community. We really see impact on the board. So a quick Two two quick comments. Uh, one, you know, on the on involving the community, I think there are great global standards of what cities have done, such as uh, uh, Kitty Kyushu, you know, which we could adopt more widely on the world and share, and sort of say that look, you know, these are you know cities of similar sizes uh, start with similar starting points. And how have they made the transition? And then learning from that best practice and trying to bring about some of those standards that become popularly aware and known in the community and then leave it to the community to actually hold policymakers and officials in the city at the local level to account for adhering to the standards that they're supposed to be following. Um, The second comment um, is I think we can rely on younger people uh, to provide a lot of energy. I mean, we see that in the environmental movement worldwide and for very good reason. If you're 60 years old, um, you think about a world 40 years out, much less than if you're 20 years old. Um, because if you're 20 years old, you'll probably be around to see that world. If you're 60 years old, you probably won't. Uh, and I think relying on uh, that younger force to worry about the future and using the energy that young people have to hold local officials to account or national officials to account is very powerful. Um, I think it can deliver very substantive change in how we operate as companies and in how we operate as a government. Excellent. Um, um, Tato, did you have anything to add? Yes, yes. Uh, the... Uh, there are, you know, really different kinds of uh, uh, environmental issues. The kind of local uh, pollutions, which I mentioned in my first remark, as uh, for that, the citizens have uh, every incentive is to fight against it. 
especially, you know, in Kitakyushu's case, uh, mothers uh, wanted to protect their children. Now, for global warming, there's no such incentives, local incentives. And uh, to give those local incentives, we return to Mr. Forbes' idea of uh, carbon pricing or carbon taxes. If there is that uh, uh, nationwide uh, a uniform uh, carbon pricing mechanism, then each local community, each small business, will have an automatic incentive to uh, to uh, to save carbon, to to to, to reduce uh, uh, carbon. And I think uh, that is a key. And uh, education uh, needed sort of follow have to follow that uh, sort of uniform carbon pricing. Without that, uh, I think a uh, uh, real uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, a strong effort to educate people would not, uh, would not uh, materialize in the result. Excellent. Um, anything to add on this topic or we're we moving on? Okay. Uh, my next and probably last question as we're, we're running short on time is all of us, um, have seen examples of how sustainable development can work within our respective countries. We've also seen examples of how sustainable development is tossed aside in the name of profit sometimes. So if, if you could um, give us one example where, just like Kitakushu, we've seen an example of a very successfully implemented community-based or, or, or macro-based model that has helped your respective countries work towards sustainable development goals, work towards the fight against climate change, and just share it with the group and whether that's applicable for a, a more international cross-border approach. That would be great. Um, any open open to the floor? I, I'll, I'll, I'll start first, I mean, because I know the least about these things. But um, I, I would say a hybrid. We had a poverty eradication model in Malaysia called the Smallholder Scheme uh, with Felder and RISDA where we used rubber plantations uh, to essentially create lots that were given uh, to families to, to uh, grow and then to tap, and they would sell it to a central uh, processing company, and they would they get paid for it. Uh, it. It lifted many, many lives. Along the way, it created education system schools in communities that didn't have schools before. It uh, allowed for the education of young people that otherwise would have no access to education and many things. Uh, what it didn't do, though, was help climate change because you were at that stage growing plantation. Plantation became big business. Rubber trees, which were okay from a from a uh, from a carbon neutrality position, was replaced by palm oil, uh, which is not so nice uh, for the environment generally. Uh, so we have now looked at a new way of doing things where we have to now. Deal with the with the communities that are that that are relying on this. So we've got vanilla plantations that we're going to introduce in Malaysia. The vanilla plantations basically for you know ten acres of vanilla, or one acre of vanilla is equivalent income of about fifty acres of palm oil or sixty acres of palm oil, and doesn't require because it's a, it's an orchid doesn't require it's a, a soil that's compatible or nice etc. And it can be grown anywhere. Uh, and so the same model that we used in Brisda and Delta and Malaysia for, for rubber and palm oil. The idea now would be to transfer that, transport that, change that to vanilla plantations, uh, where you get for, uh, for for small acreage a much higher return, allowing these farmers to make the income they need, uh, teaching them how to grow it, then taking them and processing it centrally. Uh, we believe this then also addresses the issue of then shifting the country's economy away from being completely reliant on palm oil and plantations of that size that then take away our rainforests, etc., uh, and shifting to something a bit more sustainable but provides significantly more income in the long term and still deals with the community uh, and the, the uh, citizenry that requires uh, their livelihoods maintained. So this is something that we're going to do in Malaysia, and I, and I, and I think it's this kind of innovative approach where to think outside the box and work out how do we fix this problem and it's, it's not just shutting down. It's not just stopping because too many lives and too much impact is in just shutting down. So how do we evolve this? And this is one of the ideas we have. 
from from our company's perspective. Excellent. Vinod, you had something to add? Uh, no, that's it. Okay, um, Nashad, go ahead. Sure. So uh, the uh, uh, an example the example I talk about is LEDs LED bulbs in India, um, where say 15 years ago we produced no LED bulbs. Um, we today produce them by the million, um, and the price has fallen, I believe, by around 85 uh, percent over this 15 year period. And LED, LED bulbs sound like a very small thing, but if you actually look at the energy saving uh, from switching from incandescent bulbs to LED bulbs, uh, the total saving is less. The total investment in, in LED bulbs is less than the cost of building a power plant for the energy saving that you have. So, you know, so if you would have, if you have, say, a thousand megawatts of saving um, by moving to LED bulbs, um, it would actually cost you less to put the LED bulbs in. So it's pure win-win in terms of how you go about this. And I think the government program to actually incentivize the local production of LED bulbs was a very powerful program um, and has been very effective, very successful in scaling the impact uh, of, uh, of, of lower end consumption points for something as basic as electric light uh, in homes. Uh, I'll give you a counter example. The counter example is the use of biomass uh, as an industrial fuel. Um, in India, it's very successful and very effective again because it's entirely private sector driven. Uh, you have private sector provision of the biomass itself. Uh, the biomass is not subsidized by the state um, and end users use the biomass to generate uh, process heat in their plants um, instead of using fossil fuels. I went to a distillery in Scotland some years ago, a couple of years ago, uh, which was also using a biomass boiler. And I was very happy to see this. But they were getting their biomass from Canada. And this, to me, made no sense at all. So, you know, you have biomass that supposedly gets produced in Canada. It gets shipped across the ocean in an oil-fired ship. Um, and it's somehow all sustainable. I think sometimes these kinds of policies that incentivize in a particular way, the, some of these incentives can end up twisting um, what people do in an environmentally unsustainable way. And so we should have some global framework, either a flaw carbon, ta carbon tax that applies across the board um, or no subsidies whatsoever. And we try to enable uh, something to stand uh, in the private sector on the basis of, uh, of its own economics. Eric or Tatsu? Yeah, so, so, I'll, I'll, so I, I really like both uh, those um, set of examples. And, and so I'll take another one that is um, from uh, my previous life in, in uh, dealing with sort of a former Soviet Union in, in, in Eastern Europe. And, and um, so, you know, those countries, particularly in Central Europe, have been incredibly successful in, in their energy transition. You know, from being some of the most wasteful to some of the most efficient, and uh, so, and and one thing that uh, I found was a very uh, effective mechanism was um, to involve uh, financial institutions in in in, in this and, and get financial institutions to really understand how um, how um, how to assess uh, particularly energy efficiency investment. And, and one scheme that we had, which was uh, when I was at the EBRD, which I so many examples of and which really scaled in, in a very powerful way was to, so we, we had a little bit of, of uh, subsidy money from uh, the phasing out of a nuclear power plant in, in Bulgaria. And, and we could use that to, to give to, um, to banks to build capacity to assess energy efficiency investments. And we could use a little bit of that also to give incentives to individual um, uh, entrepreneurs uh, who, for their business, wanted to convert uh, for if I'm from uh, a coal fire to a gas fire or to you know to renewables uh, and and so on. And and I saw some incredible examples, uh, particularly a bakery in Sofia that really managed to you know they had no thinking around energy efficiency before the scheme was in place. Uh, you know, once um, uh, they they got engaged with this uh, local bank that had these uh, 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 credit lines, uh, 
uh, it allowed them to completely transform their business into something that was energy efficient and, and uh, you know, had a much smaller carbon uh, uh, footprint. And so what I think, that, and what that shows that, that, you know, that spread scaled up uh, was, was very powerful. And, and the second time that we wanted to offer these credit lines, we didn't need to provide any incentives to the banks because the banks already had the skills uh, to, um, to, to uh, help uh, assess these things. And, and when I look across Asia, I think very few banks actually have this uh, kind of capacity. And, and certainly I can say from my experience now in, in looking at some of the Chinese uh, banks, I, they still don't have that um, capacity. So we, we can do it. And, and we, by the way, when we then came to the Baltic states and wanted to sell the same idea, it turned out that the commercial banks there already had developed this capacity. So I think this is just an example of how you can, you know, with relatively small um, uh, incentives um, uh, at the beginning, you can scale this up to, to you know, massive uh, scale and, 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 and really drive the transition forward. Excellent. Tatsu, did you have an example that you could share with us before we go? Well, uh, basically, I, uh, again, uh, I sort of thought that the example Mr. Forbes g- gave uh, for, you know, uh, of shipping uh, renewables from Canada to England is an excellent in- a- idea, a sort of uh, explanation for the need of uh, carbon pricing. And the, let me just uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, give you the reason why the Japanese government cannot introduce this obvious, so cannot produce, uh, propose this obvious solution for the global warming. I think uh, it's a political pressure uh, from the steel industry. And the, uh, it's sort of, in a sense, so trying to keep steel industry in an efficient state and at the same time, trying to uh, fight against global warming is contradictory. And uh, I think uh, we should uh, we should have uh, we should actually emphasize this uh, uh, carbon pricing or carbon tax, and then that would be a much more sensible uh, solution uh, for global warming than the emphasizing renewables. Doing renewables in England using the imported material from Canada simply doesn't make sense. And the, I think, uh, uh, I, I hope Indian government will nudge Japanese government <laughs> to to introduce the, you know, sort of a really effective uh, uh, international standard for global warming. Thank you. Perfect. Um, that was a really great panel, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you to Frank and Horasis for having us. Hopefully next year, we're not going to have this silly online thing anymore and we can finally meet in person <laughs> once again hopefully in Kitakyushu, which was planned for two years ago and because of the pandemic didn't quite work out um please stick around join some other panels there's some great speakers um in, in the other in the in the plenary that's coming up or is actually supposed to be running now and then in in the next panels at three o'clock so um Thank you once again to my steam panelists and guests and thank you to the audience for also attending um Yeah, and connect with them on Run the World if you have questions for them privately. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you you very much. Thank Thank you you for a very nice moderation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.